This is Actualize Freedom. Straight talk on growing clicks and conversions on Amazon FBA from people doing it every day. Now here's your host, digital marketing acrobat, Danny Kenji Carlson. What's up, guys? Danny Carlson here with Actualize Freedom Podcast. And today we have a very special guest named Brittany Brown, and she is an expert in finance when it comes to e-commerce businesses. And there's a lot of pitfalls when it comes to an e-commerce business. It's very, very complicated when it comes to cash flow. And a lot of sellers don't even know if they're making money when they're marking down their product just because they're, they're doing bank balance accounting. I've been guilty of it in the past where I look at the money in my bank account and I make all my financial decisions based on that alone, maybe not knowing that I have a big liability coming up next month or two months down the road that that money should actually be set aside for, right? Um, so this is gonna be a super valuable episode if you want to actually run a profitable e-commerce business. If you want to just run up your revenue numbers, then go listen to some other podcast. But this one is gonna be super, super important for that profit number. So welcome to the podcast. Brittany Brown, whereabouts are you calling in from today? Thanks, Danny. I'm calling in from Utah today. Awesome, awesome. So let's just dive right into the meaty part here. I think one of the things that's going to be most valuable for our listeners is really how do you set up a system to know if you're actually making money or not instead of just opening up your bank, your online banking, and just seeing what's going on or your Amazon dashboard, for example, because that we both know that doesn't tell the full picture, right? Right. It's totally inadequate. And, and, and the next step from that would be that businesses just look at whatever's depositing from Amazon and they call that sales and they're off and running. So as you said, there's a whole ton of pitfalls that e-commerce businesses run into when trying to correctly capture financial information. At the end of the day, it's really critical because most people who started businesses started businesses to make money. And the only thing that really gives you a gauge of whether or not you're succeeding at that is accurate financial information. So as you mentioned at the beginning of your, um, at the beginning of your introduction, there's a big difference between just cash face accounting and actually tracking profitability correctly so you can see how your business is performing. So a couple of things that we see being huge pitfalls in this area, if you will really want to understand how your business is performing and if you're profitable or not, there's really two things that you need to be good at tracking. The first one is accurately capturing um, channel activity. So if you've ever had a business before and you've ever done your own accounting from businesses before, you may feel like, hey, I got this. I know how this works. I go into QuickBooks or Xero and I track my transactions and I record them and I'm good to go. But that will not work for e-commerce businesses. And the reason why that's true is because in most businesses, most of the activity runs to the bank account and the credit cards. And if you're just capturing the activity of that, you're going to be 90% of the way there. But in an e-commerce business, actually, the majority of the activity actually runs through the channels that you're selling on, be it Shopify, be it Amazon, wherever you're selling, that's where the activity is running through. And if you just take your deposit that hits your bank account and you call that income, then you're actually missing 90% of the picture. So for example, most of your sellers are Amazon sellers. So let's just touch on the Amazon situation. For example, Amazon settles every two weeks. And let's say you see $75,000 hit your bank account. Well, if you were to actually go back and look at the reports for that same time frame, you would probably actually see more like $100,000 in sales and then another $25,000 in all sorts of activity, literally 60 different line items. If you're using FBA and you're using, um, you're using their system for shipping and all those kinds of things, you're going to see FBA fees, storage fees, sales tax that was collected, returns, refunds, chargebacks, all that kind of stuff. And if all you're saying is, this is the deposit that hit my bank account. I'm calling that my Amazon sales. You will miss an extraordinarily large amount of data that's actually very relevant to you as a business owner. Um, another area where we really ask our business owners to take time to get it right is with cost of goods sold. So you have no more ex important expense to understand as a business owner of a product business than cost of goods sold. And if you are um, like, a lot of e-commerce businesses understand the importance of tracking inventory, but when I say track inventory, you think quantity and I think value. So you're communicating to your channels all the quantity that you have available. You're making sure that your Amazon listings are up to date with quantity available so you don't oversell. But if you have no idea the value of that inventory when it sells and you have no idea how to correctly say, this is the, these are the items that I sold this month and this is the cost of the sold associated with it. You have no ability to see the margins and how your business is running as a whole. So one of the most, one of the biggest differences going back to your introduction between cash-based accounting 
and the ability to see profitability is actually the way that you're tracking cost of goods sold. The most common mistake we see businesses make, and I'm talking like large businesses, so we take on clients all the time that are doing anywhere from four to $10 million a year in business. They've been in business three or four years. They've had an incredible growth curve and they reach this point where they're just like, I literally have no idea how my business is doing. I have lots of cash in the bank account, but I don't actually know how much I can spend on marketing. I don't actually know how much I can, if I can afford to hire somebody, I don't even know how much FBA is costing me right now to use. The most common mistake that they're making is that when they buy their inventory, when they actually pay the vendor, they're expensing all of that right away and calling it cost of goods sold. So what ends up happening is let's say that they receive their inventory in January. In January, their, their profit and loss statement takes a huge hit, like their cost of goods sold numbers looks huge. And then every month that happens after that has almost no cost of goods sold at all. So there's this huge volatility in their profitability. They really don't know what their profit margins are. They really don't know how their business is performing. And frankly, at the end of the day, inventory is an asset on your balance sheet also affects the valuation of your business. So if you're preparing to sell your business and your balance sheet shows no inventory of any kind, then you are dramatically understating the value of your business. So that's just one example of some of the pitfalls we see. Okay. So let's dive into that for a second, because I'm sure there's a few people out there who are like, that is exactly what I'm doing right now. And I have no right. idea what's going on with my numbers. So um, e-commerce business, like you said, is pretty unique in the fact that you often have to purchase thousands and thousands of dollars of inventory at one time. And that inventory is not going to see a return for two, three, four months after you purchase it. Right. So it's going right. to really skew your profitability numbers month to month. So really right. how, how do you account for that? So you can get a real good picture of how much money you're actually making. So the first place to start is actually by just dialing in your SKU. So you can say like, these are the SKUs that we sell. This is approximately what it's costing me for, um, to have it manufactured. This is approximately what it's costing me in shipping and tariffs, et cetera. You can start by just creating what we call a product cost catalog where you're saying, these are my SKUs and these are my costs. And it can be fairly static as a starting point. So that when you then sell at the end of each month, you actually go into your channels and you say, well, how many of each SKU did I sell? And what are my costs per SKU? And that's a simple, straightforward way to start to approximate this approach. So you start there, and then as you mature upon it, you now want to start tracking this, but on a, in a, what's the opposite of static? Like the non-static dynamic. approach, whatever that yeah. word is. Dynamic, thank you. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means, dynamic, the next approach would be to handle it in a dynamic way. So now you're actually tracking all of your purchase orders as they come in, even if it's the same product costs is the last time you bought it, your tariffs and your shipping are probably different than they were last time. So now you're actually looking at landed costs and you're, you're like associated your landing costs with the SKUs that were actually purchased. And you're updating that with each purchase order that came in. You can either do this in spreadsheet form or you can bring on a low cost inventory tool that will kind of keep track of this for you as well. But that's the, that's the dynamic approach that will then allow you to actually stay yeah, I actually am tracking my cost per SKU in a dynamic way and I understand how that's moving and I'm not stuck in whatever I believe my product costs were six months ago. I know what my product costs are. And then the way to be truing that up on a regular basis is then to be counting. The count is really, really important, especially if you're using FBA because like they lose your product. Your product may be stolen by the people in your warehouse. Like you may be sending more product out the door than you thought you were to people like influencers and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, you need to be doing a periodic count so you can true up what you believe your cost of goods sold were against what you actually have left in your warehouse. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, let me, just so I'm getting this right, are you saying that we should be calculating every single shipment as kind of its own little, was this one shipment of this one product profitable or was it not? And just every single time a new shipment comes in, you're kind of, you're looking at that one shipment of product because each shipment can be sold at different price points, maybe some promotions right. for that shipment. The, the shipping costs are going to fluctuate. So really you need to be looking at each individual shipment uh, of product, right? Yeah, so I'm saying instead of keeping in a static approach where you're saying these are the costs that I decided were my product costs, instead you're now updating your product costs every time a shipment comes in. So now you're kind of like um, adding layers or you're changing the average cost to be reflective of the new set of orders that just came in 
the, well, the new shipment that came in. So you are like, you're allowing your product costs to stay up to date, given all of the purchase orders and all the shipments you received over the last little while, instead of having it be like one point in time, and we never look at it again. Instead, you're saying, every time I get a shipment in, it changed my, it changes my product costs because my shipping costs are not always the same. My tariff costs are not always the same. And maybe my product costs changed as well. So now every single purchase order and every single order you get is updating the value of your inventory. Awesome. And so for everyone who we just totally lost on all of this uh, financial <laughs> jargon here, um, you know, there obviously there are tools and there are things to simplify things out there. Um, like a friend of mine, he um, just released about a month ago, a tool called Margins. Um, you guys can check that out at go.kenjiroi.com slash margins. So G-O.K-E-N-J-I-R-O-I slash margins. Um, but so for the person who their head is spinning right now, maybe they don't have a bookkeeper, they don't really have an accountant that they work with, what would you recommend they do so that they can start getting a good picture of these numbers? Like should they create a spreadsheet yeah. or um, should they talk to an accountant? What should they do? So I would say, you, I wouldn't really recommend you talk to an accountant until you're about half a million dollars a year in revenue just because the cost of having an accountant take it over at that point is not necessarily like worth it. What I would look into is like really low cost inventory tools that will kind of track this for you. So the spreadsheet approach is great. Um, that's our favorite approach because it gives us total transparency and nothing gets lost in the software, but it does require like mad ninja Excel skills, but you can accomplish the same thing with a simple inventory tool. So QuickBooks online has an inventory tool built in zero has an inventory tool built in. Neither one of those inventory tools are like super robust and great, but one thing they do do well is they do layer on inventory costs. So they will allow you to put in inventory, put in more inventory and put in more inventory at different costs. And then you can put in like um, sales receipts that will just relieve inventory of all the products you have. Like if you were to just get on in YouTube, like QBO inventory, it would just show you a simple setup approach. Cause really the first thing you're trying to do is just have a value, just be able to identify a value that you can then associate with the SKUs that were sold. And there are tools already built in that are low cost tools. Um, Seller Labs is another one that's specific to Amazon tools. Ada X incidentally also um, is another tool that handles a lot of the um, a lot of the accounting for Amazon sellers, but it also has like a module for cost of goods sold. And if you upload your cost per SKU, it will actually spit out a cost of goods sold for the period of time. So there's a lot of tools available, a lot of which aren't even expensive. And if you are pretty confident in Excel, then you can really accomplish a lot with Excel without additional cost. Awesome. And I want to talk about something that is really, really difficult for a lot of Amazon sellers, which is managing your cash flow. Um, yeah. you know, e-commerce is so unique in that way where you have to really be projecting like, let, let's say for simplicity's sake, you had five different SKUs and you now have five different SKUs you have to order at different times for, you have to send a new um, order to a manufacturer, you pay 70% to get them, you know, or 30% to get them started and then 70% once they're completed. Um, so like two payments at different times per SKU and then like there's so many different payments that come in at different times. Um, and if you have $10,000 sitting in your bank account, it's very tempting to spend that $10,000 on marketing or on a new product or something like that. Right. When it's very likely that that $10,000 needs to go somewhere in a couple of weeks or in a month or something like that. So how do you right. recommend, um, what is the best way to really keep track of the cash flow situation for these businesses? Well, and you know, another thing that further complicates it with the e-commerce businesses is that so many of them are offshoring their manufacturing, which extends the lead time on all of their projections. So it's not like they can just run over to the store next door and pick up their product. Like a lot of them have weeks to months lead time with their product. So as far as managing cash flow goes, like you need to understand your cash cycle. And basically the cash cycle is you pay for product. Um, and you wait for that product to come and then the product sits in the warehouse and then you sell the product and then you get the payment for it. And you need to understand like how quickly that money is turning over. And of all the, like of all the metrics I would recommend you watch as a product based business, there's really two that are just paramount. One of them is this cost of goods sold and an income relationship, which is gross profit margin. But the other one is inventory turnover. 
because if you are buying, it's very tempting to buy large batches of your product because it does cut down on your shipping costs per SKU. But if you have a whole bunch of inventory sitting in your warehouse that now you can't sell, or maybe you can sell it, but it's not moving as quickly as you wanted it to, basically anytime you have a bunch of inventory sitting somewhere, that is cash that's tied up. It's cash that you can't, it's, it's cash sitting in non-cash form, right? That you can't convert to cash without a lot of effort, a lot of work, and sometimes a lot of money. And so if you don't carefully manage that cycle and that relationship, you can find yourself with inventory you can't sell and then the inability to stay in business, even though you have sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product, you still can't stay in business because you can't convert it to cash quickly enough to meet the demands of your business, like payroll, marketing, rent, all those other things. So as far as like managing it, I would recommend just like spreadsheets. Once again, like spreadsheets are really the answer to every financial problem you possibly have. Spreadsheets are ultimately the, a great place to start. Just understanding like um, the time at which you purchase the product, how long it's going to take you to sell the product and projecting out seasonalities so that you know, for example, if you have a ton of we have a client, well, we have lots of clients that do this, but one in particular, they do such a massive amount of money on Black Friday, but they're, they're like, and then they, they sell a ton more for Chinese New Year. And so right at the end of the year, they always experience a cash crisis because they have to ramp up the purchase of their inventory in anticipation of the seasonal sales. And then it doesn't really finish converting to cash until after the Chinese New Year, sometime after the end of January. And so they always experience a cash crisis. And because they know that now, they've been able to, in anticipation of that, go out and get funding. So, you know, Shopify has great funding options. PayPal has great funding options. They've been able to go out and get funding in advance that are more favorable on terms than when they find out that they're out of cash when it's time to make payroll and they have to pay in three days. That's not the time to know that you're out of cash. You need to see that coming months in advance. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't go out and buy that brand new motorcycle when you got that cash in the bank <laughs> and uh, so, you needed to save right. for something else, right? Um, or that vacation yeah. or something like that. Not to rub it in uh, to you guys who are over in summer cold right now. but um, Right. Okay, so I mean, this can be very complicated, right? So basically we're saying that you have to make a calculation. How fast is your inventory turning over? And then when is that likely to run out? And you're going to need to have your buffer of your lead time on top of that. So let's say that your lead time, it takes 30 days for your manufacturer to make it and ship it over to the United States for you. You need to make a calculation of when, when are you going to be at inventory zero 30 days in advance? So, I mean, this is like you said, some spreadsheet wizardry here. Are there That's any totally. resources, um, right. resources or tools or anything that you can point people towards who are not spreadsheet wizards? Right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a ton of tools out there that help with like um, just inventory management. Like I know that QuickBooks online recently released a um, like low stock or reorder point feature in their inventory. So even though their inventory is not like, it, it doesn't handle, for example, like it doesn't have a really clean way to allocate landed costs, for example, across SKUs, but it does do a good job of kind of helping you manage low order status and your reorder points. And if you just get online and you Google like a uh, reorder point calculation or inventory turnover ratio or days in inventory, it'll start to help you understand like, like the, the things you should be considering. In fact, this is a great idea for a blog. Um, we have a ton of blogs on our website that just talk about all aspects of e-commerce accounting. So everything from like inventory setup to how to handle correctly Amazon accounting to tools that you can use to sales taxes, like the potential fire that will burn your e-commerce business down. And we will release a blog sometime in the next two months regarding uh, managing inventory and managing the timing of inventory because that's a great point. This is a huge need. And I don't know that I'm aware of a resource that just kind of like brings together all the pieces in an effective way. But it is really important. It's like, like watching your inventory turnover after you know how to calculate it. And it's a pretty straightforward calculation. I think it's like beginning inventory, ending inventory, and like... Like, I don't, I, I can't tell you the calculation right off the top of my head, but it's not, it's not complex. And then it's the kind of thing you can just watch and you can say, wow, my days in inventory last quarter were 18 and my days in inventory now are 30. Like something is, I'm, I'm on my way for a cash crisis if something doesn't change. 
gross profit margin, days in inventory, and inventory turnover ratio, those are all indicators of a cash crisis coming if they're trending the wrong direction. Along with like days in AR would be, a, days in accounts receivable would be another one, although that doesn't touch e-commerce businesses as much unless they also have wholesale channels. Um, but inventory, the management of that inventory, like I, I wish I just knew the name of a bunch of tools that are like, oh, these are great for inventory projections. And I know they're, I know they, they're out there and I know they exist, but because they're more on the seller side instead of the accounting side, I'm not as familiar. Do you know of any of those tools, Danny? Like which tools are you aware of that do like inventory projecting? This podcast is brought to you by Kenji ROI, a complete done for you service for your Amazon listing creation and optimization. Everything from powder photography, including lifestyle images with a real model, graphic design images and studio images, to the copywriting and keyword optimization, to videos and enhanced brand content if you're lucky enough to have brand registry. We also manage marketing when it comes to Amazon ads and also for some bigger sellers out there who might be interested in building a messenger list, we offer services creating the many chat funnels to follow up with customers for more reviews, to help build your own audience so you can launch new products to help rank for new keywords. Um, and there is Facebook ad management built into that as well for the right sellers. So if you want to learn more about Kenji ROI, head to K-E-N-J-I-R-O-I.com. That is actually my middle name, Kenji, with the R-O-I added onto the end. I mean, there are lots of them out there and these tools are going to range from, you know, $30 a month up to several thousand dollars per month, depending on how complicated you need it. So, uh, and the reason I'm diving so much into this topic is that uh, some of you out there, you're probably thinking, hey, I only have one product. I only have two or three products. Like it's very easy to manage if you only have a few products in just a simple spreadsheet or a document or something like that. Right. But if you don't, this is still super important to understand. Even if you are only going to be a three product business, um, it's very important to understand these concepts. And if you do grow into a larger business, um, once you hit like five SKUs, maybe you're, you're gonna, it's going to start to be a nightmare. Yeah. Certainly if you're 10 SKUs or 20 SKUs or 30 SKUs, this is a massive, massive problem for businesses like that. Um, and so just understanding this is really important. Um, so a few tools out there. I mean, Seller Legend is a really great low cost one. I believe uh, PPC Entourage Margins does this as well. The, um, the tool that I just mentioned earlier, that new one. Um, and that one does go into profitability per SKU. So that is what I would recommend um, for that for sure. Um, but like I said, guys, even if you're not going to do this, understand it at the very least. So you know what's going on and you can spot this as a problem in your business. Um, and Brittany, there's another thing that is really common, um, is when it comes to valuations of an e-commerce business, right? You touched on this a little bit earlier, how a lot of sellers, they just record their Amazon payouts as their top line revenue and they're completely underselling themselves when it comes to if they want to sell their e-commerce business in the future, because the valuation is based off of the revenue, right? And not right. only that, I'd imagine that they're under-reporting the revenue to, to the government, right? So like right. they actually could be owing a lot of tax to the government because they're not reporting their revenue correctly. And that, that's a big right. problem. It's a big problem. And, and in, lieu of what, in lieu of what Danny just said, like it is really easy when you feel like your gut is kind of wrapped around your business and you're like, oh, I, I know where I'm standing. I kind of have a good feel. Like as your business ramps up in complexity, it's really easy to dive into these things when your business is small. And when your business increases in complexity, it is incredibly difficult to go back after the fact. And for example, identify the value of everything that's in your warehouse. It's really, really tough. So as far as what he just spoke on with uh, protecting your future valuation. So most e-commerce owners I know are aware of the fact that they have a hot commodity, like they're pro not just their product, but their business. Um, there are all kinds of buyers and investors right now that are just out there picking up brands and, and adding them to their portfolio. So the exit potential of e-commerce businesses is quite high. In fact, I read a thing the other day that said like e-commerce businesses is now like approaching SaaS as far as um, multiples on revenue and multiple on net income with their exit opportunity. So it's just a, I mean, just to give you an idea, like as a service-based business, if I were to ever sell my business, I'm lucky, I'll be lucky to get more than a multiple of one on my business. So what that basically means is if I'm a business that's selling a million dollars a year in revenue, I'm likely to get a million dollars for my business. But if I was an e-commerce business selling a million dollars, my, my multiple is more likely to be three or more. So I could get 
three million dollars on my one million dollar a year revenue business so because most valuations are in some degree based on not on um, revenue when you do your channel activity when you record your channel activity wrong and you guys remember we touched on this right at the very beginning the people typically record whatever they see deposit from their channel as the revenue from their business you're you will always be understating revenue or I guess I should say almost always you will almost always be understating revenue when you do it that way and so if you don't record the revenue of your business correctly which would be at the true gross amount minus everything that happened reconcile to whatever actually deposited into your bank account you will literally be leaving money on the table if you don't take the time to to figure out how to do this right so you know maybe maybe it's not critical to you staying in business each day and day out but if you ever decide to sell your business or if you're ever having evaluation done for that purpose just know that it will be really important for you to go back and restate your revenue numbers correctly according to what what really happened on your channels or else you'll be leaving money on the table we recently did a cleanup for an e-commerce business that was doing about eight million dollars a year in revenue and by the time we restated revenue with his crowdfunding, his Shopify activity, his Amazon activity, it wound up being like an $800,000 difference. So if he's selling on any kind of multiple, so let's say he has a multiple of like three, that's a $2.4 million difference in valuation if it's a multiple on revenue. So it's not a, it's not a small inconsequential thing to consider when you are building an e-commerce business. I would say like protect your future exit potential by taking the time to figure out how to do it right or by hiring someone who knows how to do it right if you're large enough to justify that but you're literally leaving money on the table if you don't record your revenue at least correctly yeah and just to be super clear on that we're talking about things like um you know all of these different channels amazon ebay all they all have certain fees associated with them right and what you're right. getting paid out into your bank account is in the case of amazon minus the amazon fulfillment fee minus the amazon referral fee uh, minus any Amazon pay-per-click expenses if you have it expensed out to your your actual Amazon payouts uh, There is so many different fees that um, Is actually earned revenue from your company from a technical standpoint that right. that is not being recorded, right? Right, totally totally. There's so many reasons why whatever you saw hit your bank account is less than what you actually sold on the channel and in, a, and in a typical business, when they're looking at valuation, like you get to record your actual revenue minus all of your expenses. But in e-commerce businesses, what you see deposit is already revenue minus a whole bunch of expenses. So if you're just taking that number and calling it revenue, you will be understating the revenue of your business. Yeah, and I don't know about you guys, but I sure like to sleep at night, not thinking about um, the government coming after you for uh, an audit and then ripping all this apart. And that, that just doesn't sound like fun to me. So right. I agree. <laughs> I would take this advice very well here. So I think lastly, there's something, this is obviously a very controversial topic and uh, you know, the government is doing things to deal with this currently. Um, we're talking about sales tax here. And I know this is a very murky topic with good arguments on both sides of what you should be doing. So what is your opinion on um, Amazon FBA sellers when it comes to sales tax? Like should, should they be paying in every single Every single state that they have a, a nexus for how, like what do you what do you think so what I think is that um, it, it is a terrible burden for e-commerce businesses that's what I think and I think that um, the government hasn't made it any easier so initially the rule was basically location nexus which seems pretty straightforward like hey I'm running a business I'm based out of Utah as long as I collect in Utah I'm fine but in reality the location nexus, especially for Amazon sellers, is a monster because if you're using FBA to fulfill, then your FBA activity in warehouses across the country actually creates location nexus for you. And it's it's such a bear because it's not like Amazon set sends you notification and says, hey, we're sending your product to the warehouse in Nebraska. Like you don't find that out until Nebraska sues the warehouse to find out who the sellers are and then they come after you. So if you, like FBA is such a huge risk point for businesses, well, sales tax period, because like you, Nexus is created in states and you don't even know, like you didn't even know. Another, um, the, the law that came down last summer, Wayfair versus South Dakota, basically created the opportunity for every single state now to determine for themselves what creates Nexus in their state. So now not only do you have location Nexus issues, but now you also have each individual state saying, 
you know, if you're doing this much business in our state, now you have Nexus in our state. And once again, it's not like they send you a notice saying, hey, just so you know, just cross that threshold. Like we now consider you as having Nexus in the state. What happens instead? And you just get an ominous letter from them one day. Like they just say, you know, we're auditing you for sales tax. And that's the point at which you find out that FBA put your product in their state two years ago. And that's the point at which you find out that you're that your cells cross the cross the threshold of nexus low, um, economic nexus in their state like six months ago, and the biggest problem with sales tax is if you knew about it at the time that the cell was made, you could have just collected it, right? But if you don't know, the state doesn't care. Like they still come after you and they say, "Hey, cough up the money that you should have collected in sales tax and you didn't." So now instead of it just being something you collect and you have the hassle of remitting it. Now it's literally money you have to cough up. Like it's margin against your margin on your product because you didn't know to collect at the time of sell. So one other thing I wanna bring up about that is if you have, if you have Nexus created by say FBA activity, that Nexus actually applies to every single channel you sell on. So if you have Nexus in Texas because of FBA activity, then you have to, you have to configure your Shopify channel also to collect in Texas as well. So Nexus is like, it's such a, it's such a monster. Like it really is like the, like the fire that will burn your e-commerce business down if you don't get ahead of it. Now, in regards to your question, Danny, like, what do I recommend? Um, I recommend you just know what, what state you have Nexus in, because that way you can make an informed decision. So sometimes you may find that you have Nexus in like 27 different states, but the majority of them, you only have a very small exposure in. And so I hate to go on record as saying you should just fly under the radar on those, but like the burden of, of sales tax compliance is such a huge burden. Um, it's getting easier nowadays with tools like Taxstar, Taxify, and Avalara, but it's still such a huge burden. But if you at least know what state you have Nexus in, you can, you can then be like proactive about which state you register in, um, whether or not you like how you handle it. But if you, if you just kind of like put your blinders on and you just hide in a corner and, and suck your thumb and like hope it all goes away, like big problems, huge, like huge problems. So um, if you are, if you're a company that's doing at least a million dollars in revenue, you need to get serious about the sales tax problem because at that point you have a pretty big target on your back and the liability exposure that you are experiencing is, is, is incrementally massive. You know, if you're just starting and you're doing say less than hundred thousand dollars a year, and especially if you're not using FBA, just, just collect and remit in the state that you're operating in and just stay aware. Um, there's, there's websites you can go on that will let you run like reports that will show like where you have Nexus. We do Nexus analysis for clients. I'm sure almost any tax accountant would also do a Nexus analysis just be informed, like just know where you have Nexus and what your exposure is in those states. And then you can make an informed decision instead of being surprised after the fact when you get a letter from the state. Yeah. And I mean, there's so much to unpack there, but I think when it, when things are this complicated, like when literally every state has different rules for what constitutes Nexus and they have all different rates, even counties within states have different oh, rules, right? Totally. Just, yes. Just such a beast and such a monster. Um, I, think, I think your advice is really useful. Like have some, some kind of rules that you have set up for yourself. I mean, it, like you said, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars revenue a year, does it make sense to go through this whole process and spend the money to become compliant in every single state? If you only owe them $50 or something right, like that. Exactly. Um, so a, a few things I want to touch on, like how much does it really cost to go through the process of registering for these states? Um, and then secondly, what would you recommend is like maybe a good threshold for, Hey, I owe this state maybe a hundred dollars sales tax liability or a thousand dollars sales tax. Maybe now it's time to start um, registering and paying for that. So that's a great question. Um, so tools like tax jar and taxify and Avalara, they make it really simple to stay on top of the compliance issue. If you just take the time to set it up. So I think like Textjar and Taxify, I want to say they run somewhere between like $40 a month and $70 a month. I think Avalara is right in that range as well. And then there's like a per, there's a per fee for um, actually remitting the return, which I want to say is somewhere between $30 and $70 per return also. 
So I'd say when you get to a point where the exposure and the liability you're facing is more than the compliance costs, you definitely need to be on top of it. Um, as far as what does it cost to register, either a ton of time and headache on your part, but anybody can do it. Like you don't have to be a CPA to register with the states. It's just paperwork. The problem is every single state is different. Every single state process is different. Every single state portal is different. Um, I know for us, like it costs, we, we charge $130 to register each state. I, we're kind of probably right in the middle in the pricing there. So like, that's probably what you're looking at. If you want to handle it yourself, that's what you're like, that's what your comparison costs on that would be. Um, but it's so not, is it a free process. There's no registration fee. Yeah. For the oh no, there is some States do have registration fees, but it's a free process as far as like, um, it, like, it's not, it, it's not a ton of money, right? It, it's fairly, it's fairly innocuous. The amount of money they charge to register in States, those who do charge and most of them don't. I'm charging just, like under a hundred dollars kind of thing. Not like, not like $1,500. Yeah, no, yeah. no, not even close. No, not even close. So it's just the time, which time is money, right? But getting registered in each state, the biggest problem with registering each state though, is if you're not then prepared to actually set up your channels to collect and you don't have a system in place to actually read to remit, like now you're on their radar. Now they know you have Nexus there. Like you it, don't register until you're prepared to actually be compliant because the minute you register, you're on their radar. And the interesting thing about sales tax is just because Texas audited you and they're one of like 27 states where you have Nexus, you might still be flying under the radar in the other 26 states. So it really is kind of this game of like chess, right? Like, do I register? Do I get on their radar? Do I continue to try to fly under the radar? What is my actual liability exposure in that state? What are my compliance costs going to be? Like it's uh, so we actually have a, we actually have a white paper on our, on our website that goes through the entire process of sales tax, like how to, how to determine nexus, how to get registered, how to set up your channels, how to use a tool, like all the things you need to consider. And it's really not like, it's really not rocket science. It's more like, it's not like each state makes it super easy for you. And it's not like there's a resource in general where it just breaks it all out for you. It's more of like, what are you missing? Because you didn't know you didn't know it. Um, but it's, uh, it's not after you kind of get in the groove of it and you kind of know like these states want me to handle it monthly and these states want me to handle it quarterly and these states only want me to handle it yearly. After you put a schedule together, like you could hand it off to your admin and they can handle it for you. It's just getting ahead of it. That's the, that's the trick. Yeah. It's just a, it's one of those things where it's a monster to set up, but it's an even bigger monster if you don't set it up and you oh, are forced exactly to set it up after the fact once you've already ran a whole right. bunch of sales through it, right? That's what you really don't want to happen. Yeah. All right. Well, awesome, Brittany. This has been super valuable, if not um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a handful for a lot of people's brains. I know my head is spinning a little bit right now and you know, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of this stuff and even this, this kind of stuff makes my head spin, right? The financials, the numbers. So, I know that you have a service, you do offer the service for e-commerce sellers. If people did want to reach out to you and they just want someone to take it off their hands, how can they do so? So you can go to our website, ledgergurus.com, and there's a contact us form. You can either call us or you can email us. Basically what we do is we just handle all things sales tax. I mean, handle all things in commerce. Yes, sales tax is included. So like inventory, cost of goods sold, sales tax, bill pay, payroll, budgeting, cash flow management, all those things. Our goal is to like allow business owners to focus on running their businesses and not getting bogged down in the numbers. The numbers are so important and they should be informing your decisions, but it's not important that you're the one calculating them. It's not important that you're the one like doing all the work of that. It's just important that you know how to then take the information and make educated, informed decisions. So that's how you get a hold of us. Um, we work with businesses that are selling on all platforms across the board. If it's e-commerce, we speak it and we live it. Awesome, Brittany. And um, that resource you mentioned for sales tax, is that just on your, your website's blog there? Yeah, if you just go to Ledger Gurus and then there's a little tab that says downloads, there's actually two white papers there. One of them is a sales tax resource and one of them is another one that says five signs that of trouble with your e-commerce business bookkeeping. So the, the point we're really trying to make there is just because you have a bookkeeper and they're doing your accounting, e-commerce accounting is so different. How do you identify whether or not your bookkeeper actually knows what she's doing from an e-commerce position or whether or not she's creating a bunch of garbage for you? That paper just has a bunch of like signs of trouble and, and ways that you can identify whether or not your accountant knows what they're doing when it comes to product-based and e-commerce businesses. 
Awesome. Super, super valuable, Brittany. Um, yeah, you're someone who has a lot of experience when it comes to e-commerce accounting. And as you guys have probably found out by now, if you try to find an accountant, there are very few accountants out there percentage wise who are familiar with the unique concerns of e-commerce and, you know, cross border e-commerce, especially. Right. So uh, if you guys are looking for someone like that, Brittany is someone with a lot of experience and you can reach out. So thank you so much for coming on, Brittany. And until next time, guys, you can find the show notes at KenjiROI.com slash blog and the resources from the episode will be mentioned there. And until next time, guys, take care. Thanks, Danny. This podcast is sponsored by the Helium 10 suite of tools. And we at Kenji ROI have been using Helium 10 for more than three years now. They have so many tools packed into one, I don't think that there's a better value. Um, And we use it all the time for ourselves and our clients. So we can actually recommend it from real experience. We use their keyword tracker to see how our product launches are doing, the keyword indexing tool to ensure that you're actually showing up for your main keywords. Super, super important step right there. And also Magnet and Cerebro, a really powerful combination for finding keywords your competitors are using or just finding new keywords to put into your listing in general. You should be using this on you know, at least a monthly basis to see if any new keywords are coming up um, because new searches are coming up all the time, guys. Like people are searching on Google Um, I forget the number, but a huge percentage of those searches are brand new, never been done searches. So if you guys want a discount code, you can use 50 Kenji ROI for 50% off your first month of Helium 10 or 10 Kenji ROI for 10% off for life. So that's a pretty good discount. You might as well. Um, We use them and recommend them for years. So if you guys need that, you guys will definitely get good value out of Helium 10. For show notes and resources mentioned in this episode, visit KenjiROI.com.